Hello, welcome back for chapter 7 of Stick of the Dump. This chapter is called Party Manners. Just like now, this, this chapter takes place in the Easter holidays. It was the Easter holiday. Barney and Lou were doing some painting in the dining room and Granny had spread some sheets of newspaper over the table in case they made a mess. Barney had his elbows on the table and was reading the newspaper. Hey Lou, he suddenly cried. Look what it says here. It says... Bottoms Mammoth Circus. Do you think we can go to it? I expect it's an old newspaper, said Lou, without looking up from the horse she was drawing. The circus has probably been and gone a long time ago. No, but Lou, do come and see, begged Barney. It might not have. Lou came round the table and looked at the advertisement. World's greatest travelling show, she read. Golly, Liberty Horses, Ranji and his Elephants, Daring Wild Animal Act. Yes, but Lou, when is it? said Barney impatiently. Wait a minute. It opens at Maidsford, April the 17th. That's next week. Come on, Barney, let's ask Granny if we can go. Back in those days, they had live animals at the circus, not like any more. But when they bounced into the drawing room, their grandmother was sitting in a chair talking to a strange lady. This sort of thing was unusual enough in Granny's house. They stood in the doorway goggling until their grandmother said, Come and say how do you do to Mrs Falcon Green, children. They came in and shook hands. These are my grandchildren, Barney and Lou, explained grandmother to the strange lady. They're staying with me for part of the holidays. But how nice for you, cooed Mrs Falcon Green, and such bonny children too. I do wish I had known about them. I'm giving a fancy dress party for my little niece on Wednesday. Do you think Barney and Lou would like to come? Most children nowadays seem to hate parties, but I think they're good for them, don't you? Oh, a fancy dress party, exclaimed Lou. Do let's go, Granny. I'll go as a puma. And I'll be a caveman, said Barney. Granny, can we? And Granny's... And Granny, can we go to the circus too? It's next Monday. Please, Granny, let's... And here they are looking at the circus advertisement. Now, 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 exclaimed Granny. Circuses and cavemen and pumas. I'm afraid we'll have to see, dears. They do seem to be keen, the darlings, said Mrs Falcon Green. Do bring them if you can. I'm sure they'd look charming as a puma and a caveman. My little niece is going to be Dresden Shepherdess. We got the costume specially from London and she looks so sweet in it. It's been so delightful meeting your charming grandchildren. I do hope we shall be seeing them on Wednesday. Mrs Falcon Green swept out and drove off in a large shiny car and Granny began to explain the difficulties of making fancy dress costumes with only a day and a half to do it in. Perhaps they could go to the circus instead of the party but she thought their parents were coming at the weekend to take them home. The children went off rather gloomily. They hadn't the heart to go on painting. Lou curled up with an animal storybook and Barney stood by the window and thought... Then, without a word, Barney slipped out of the house. When he got to the middle of the back lawn, he stopped and thought again. He went back into the house, crept upstairs and searched around his bedroom until he found his precious collection of glass marbles. Then he slipped out of the house again and set off for the chalk pit. He was wondering if the plan he had thought of would work. Or rather... He hadn't got a plan, he just had a feeling that Stig could help him once more. But it was going to be difficult to explain this time. He was sure that Stig wouldn't understand about fancy dress parties. But Stig had such a lot of things in his den that some of them were bound to come in useful, if he could get Stig to part with them. When he got to the den he found Stig happily peeling an old umbrella somebody had thrown away down the pit. He ripped the cover off and tried it on himself in different ways. By tearing a bigger hole in the middle and climbing into it, he found it made quite a useful sort of skirt. That's clever, Stig, exclaimed Barney, and it'll keep the rain off too. Stig then turned his attention to the frame of the umbrella. He wrenched the little struts off one by one and then sat looking at them as they lay in a heap in front of him. Barney could tell he was wondering what he could use them for. He found the first use without thinking 
it was just right for scratching a niche in the middle of his back. He looked at another one for some time and played with it in his hands. He found that he could stick its two legs into the ground so that the long part reached forward at an angle. Suddenly he reached for a small turnip and stuck it on the end that was in the air. The whole thing wobbled a bit, so he fitted another strut so that there were four legs to hold up the turnip. Then he brought it near the fire so that the turnip was hanging over the hot embers. And there it was, a standing toasting fork, or spit. Stig played with another of the pieces of metal and bent it with his strong hands so that one of the ends snapped off. So then he had a thin piece of metal with a hole in the end. It was not long before he had rubbed the other end to a point on a rough stone and there was a useful big needle. Stig seemed very pleased with all the things he could do with his bits of umbrella. He put the other metal parts aside, broke off the handle, which was carved like a Scotty dog, and stuck that into the wall as a decoration, and put the point of the umbrella against the wall with his weapons. It would make a good arrow. Barney had been so fascinated watching Stig inventing uses for the bits of umbrella that he had almost forgotten what he had come for. Then he remembered about the fancy dress party. He put his hand into his pocket and took out a glass marble. I brought this for you, Stig, he said. Stig took the marble with interest and held it up to the light, grinning and put it in his mouth. No, no, Stig, cried Barney. It's not for eating. Spit it out, Stig, please. Stig took the marble out of his mouth and looked at Barney questioningly. It's just for playing with, explained Barney. Look, here's another. And he rolled the second marble along the ground to Stig. Stig seemed amused at the way the little glass ball rolled around, flashing in the light. He rolled his marble at Barney's and they struck and bounced apart. He played with both of them for a bit and then handed them back to Barney. No, they're for you, Stig, said Barney. You can keep them. Stig put them carefully in a niche in the wall and then seemed to look about for something to give Barney in exchange. He picked up two or three of his precious umbrella bones and offered them to Barney, but Barney pushed them away. No, thank you. I don't think I want bits of umbrella, he said. Stig looked relieved. He didn't really want to part with them. He went to a pile of metal things and came back with a brass bedstead knob and offered it to Barney. Still Barney shook his head hoping that Stig would not be offended if he kept on refusing things. He had his eye on a pile of skins in the corner, and Stig seemed to notice this. For he went across to it and picked up a sort of apron of rabbit skins stitched together, just like what he usually wore himself. Barney's face lit up. Can I have that, Stig? Oh, thank you. And he took the skins under his arm. There were a lot more skins in the pile. Barney squatted down and turned them over. There were mole skins, squirrel skins, things that looked like cat, cat skins, and they made Barney wonder how they got there. Then he gave a gasp of surprise. Near the bottom was the skin of a great animal, head and all, and it was golden and spotted with black. A leopard! Barney dragged it out and goggled at it. Gosh, Stig, did you kill this? he asked. Stig looked at him. Barney made a spearing movement at the skin, put a questioning expression on his face and pointed to Stig. Stig grinned and shrugged his shoulders. He seemed to be willing that Barney should think he had killed a leopard, but Barney was rather suspicious. He had seen leopard skins like this worn by soldiers in military bands, and he had seen them on floors in people's houses. Pe perhaps someone had just thrown this one away. It was amazing what people did throw away. You only had to look around the dump and in Stig's cave to see that sometimes they were quite valuable. Anyhow, there was the leopard skin, and Lou wanted to go to the party as a leopard. Or was it a puma? She ought to be quite satisfied with this leopard anyway. There was only a few patches where the hair was falling out, but would Stig want to part with it? Barney felt in his pocket. He had only spent two marbles so far, and he had quite a lot more. He took out two more held them out to Stig and pointed at the leopard skin. Stig looked at the marbles, looked at the skins and looked very doubtful. 
Barney added another marble to the two in his hand. Stig still looked doubtful. Barney took two more marbles from his pocket. Now there were five. Suddenly, Stig seemed to understand that Barney had quite a pocket full of marbles to spend. He held out both hands to Barney with all the fingers spread out. Ten? A leopard skin cost ten marbles, thought Barney. He hoped he had that many. He put the first five marbles onto the ground and counted out what was left in his pocket. Six, seven, eight, nine. There were three more. Here. Here. You might as well have them all, said Barney, and handed over all twelve. Stig had been checking the marbles on his fingers while Barney counted. When he found he had more marbles than fingers, he was so delighted that he went to another corner of the cave and came back with a stone axe on a wooden handle and gave it to Barney with the skin. Golly, Stig, can I have that as well? exclaimed Barney. He was delighted too. Oh, Stig, you are kind to let me have all these things. Thank you, thank you. I've got to go now, Stig, and show Lou what we've got. We'll be able to go to the fancy dress party now. Goodbye. And Barney danced out, clutching the two bundles of skins and the stone axe. When he got back to the house, he had an idea. He took the bundles quietly to his own room, undressed except for his underclothes, and after some struggles with a couple of safety pins, got himself dressed in the rabbit skins. He looked at himself in the mirror and scowled fiercely. But there was something missing. Bother, he had had a haircut only two weeks ago and he didn't have nearly enough hair. He had another idea. He crept downstairs to the broom cupboard and took the head off a mop. When he tried it on his own head in front of the mirror, it looked just right. He found a way of tying it under his chin so that it stayed there. He took his axe in one hand and the leopard skin in the other and crept along the passage to his sister's room. As he expected, she was still lying on her bed with a book. He gave a whoop and charged into the room, waving his axe. Lou jumped like a startled cat and faced Barney furiously. You're not to frighten people like that when they're not expecting it, she said angrily. I knew it was you, Barney. Oh, no, you didn't, chuckled Barney. Anyhow, I'm not Barney. I'm Stog, Stig's brother. And he did a war dance around the bedroom. Where have you been? asked Lou more calmly. Me? Me being hunting, said Barney. Look what I killed. And he threw the leopard skin on the floor. Lou's eyes nearly popped out of her head. Golly, Barney, where did you get that? she said. Killed it in the wood boasted Barney. No, tell me honestly, Barney, please. Well, I didn't really kill it. I was just pretending, said Barney. I got it from Stig. Oh, Stig, scoffed Lou. You and your Stig. You mean you found it in the dump? I got it from Stig, I tell you, repeated Barney. And you owe me twelve marbles. You needn't have it if you don't want it. And he snatched it away. No, no, please, Barney, let me have it. It's a lovely leopard skin. I'll get you some marbles next time we go into town. Come on, help me try it on. And between them, with the help of pins and strings, they managed to dress Lou in the leopard skin. The bare patches hardly showed at all, and it didn't really smell any more than a real leopard would. And once Lou was inside the skin, she became more like a big cat than any leopard had ever been. She wrinkled up her nose and spat. She slunk and clawed. They hunted each other in and out of the bedrooms and along the passages. And then Lou said, Pretend I'm a tame lion. Leopard, sorry. And you're my master. And we live in this cave. And they crept under Lou's bed and curled up. Barney said, Look, Lou, about this party on Wednesday. I know where the house is. Just through the woods. We needn't even ask Granny to take us. We'll just go. And here you can see them. Barney dressed up as a caveman and Lou prowling like the leopard. One or two stars had come out in the dark blue sky overhead and there was a golden wash of sunset in the west above the dark woods. A blackbird was trying out his new spring voice from the elm tree. It had been the first mild dry day of spring and the air was beginning to feel alive with the earth warming up and buds opening and things creeping out of their winter beds. 
a leopard and a Stone Age hunter, as they let themselves quietly out of the back door, felt they couldn't possibly have stayed indoors any longer without bursting. The leopard dropped to hands and feet as soon as it reached the lawn, but the hunter said, Oh, come on, Lou, we'll be late if you're going to crawl all the way. I can go just as fast like this, said the leopard, and went bounding off towards the back gate. As they let themselves into the paddock, Flash the pony pricked up his ears and snorted and went careering around the paddock in alarm and excitement. Silly old Flash, called the leopard, it's only me. I thought you were a leopard, said Barney, and so did Flash. No wonder he's frightened. They made their way along darkening tracks and footpaths. Sometimes the leopard would go ahead and leap out from behind a bush at the hunter, and sometimes the hunter would run on and lie in wait for the leopard. One time, when Barney was lying in ambush behind a hollow beech stump, Lou crept up behind him and jumped on him instead of coming along the path and being jumped on. Barney was cross. That's not fair, he complained. It's my turn to do you. But Lou only laughed in a catty sort of way and went bouncing off ahead again. Barney sat down rather sulkily and let her go on. He should have had another turn, he thought. He heard Lou's footsteps dying away along the track and then suddenly it was the snarl and roar she usually gave when she was ambushed. It sounded rather astonished this time. Then he heard Lou's voice. Barney, it was my turn for an ambush. How did you get ahead so quickly? But he hadn't gone ahead. He'd been sitting here. Who was Lou talking to and what was going on? He got up and ran along the path between the dark thickets. He found Lou a good distance ahead, crouching down and panting. You did make me jump that time, said Lou. I wasn't expecting you. How did you get there so soon? Get where? asked Barney, wondering. Behind that oak tree. I know it was you all right, but I wasn't expecting you, said Lou. But I wasn't behind that oak tree. I was along the path there, said Barney. Oh, don't be silly, Barney. I saw you with my own eyes, didn't I? said Lou crossly. You must have been there. But I wasn't, I promise, Barney protested. How could I have got there? Lou said nothing for a moment. Then in a different voice she said, I think we'd better stop playing this game. We'll only be late for the party. Let's just walk on. They went on side by side. The wood was getting really dark now. And as they went along by the fir plantation, the leopard and the hunter actually found themselves holding hands. You know, people say they sometimes have a feeling someone's following them, Lou suddenly said in a voice that was trying to be bright and ordinary. What about it? said Barney. Oh, nothing, said Lou. I suppose it's not far now to the Falcon Greens. But Barney had suddenly had an idea. Lou had seen something behind an oak tree looking like him, and now there was this feeling of being followed. Barney thought he knew what was going on, but Lou didn't and he laughed softly to himself. I don't see anything to laugh at, snapped Lou, almost tearfully, and she stamped her foot. They came out at last into the lane, crossed over, and there was the entrance to the Fork and Greens Drive. They could see cars parked outside the house, big ones and little ones, and lights blazed from the windows and from over the front door. Lou's eyes began to sparkle, but now Barney started to feel uncomfortable. He liked parties almost as much as Lou, once they'd started, but he felt shy about going up to the big door and ringing the bell. As Lou skipped up the steps and pulled the handle, Barney took a grip on his axe and looked back along the shadowy drive. And yes, he was almost sure something had slipped between two rhododendron bushes. It was what he had thought. Someone was lurking behind them, and it was Stig. The great front door opened and Mrs Falcon Green stood there, looking a little distracted already. Hello, do come in, she cried. Oh, it's the puma and the caveman. How sweet of you to come. And how realistic. She sniffed a little at the animal smell that came in with them. But there was a wail from behind her and she had to turn around to the mass of children of all ages who were hurtling about the big hall or standing dumbly in corners. Oh dear, who is it behind the mask there? Lone Ranger, or is it Zorro? Please don't poke little Bo Peep with your sword, will you dear? 
She's only three and doesn't like it. So there's Mrs. Falcon Green letting them into the party. Can you see? I think she lived in rather a big posh house. Lou looked round excitedly at the dressed up children. There were peasant girls and ladies from the Middle Ages and cowboys and kings and queens and more cowboys and a spaceman who was looking rather hot already and more cowboys and Indians and squaws but she seemed to be the only one in a real animal skin. Barney was looking at the walls of the hall. Look at all those things on the walls, Lou, he whispered. There was hardly a square foot of the wall that was not covered with trophies. Heads of gazelles and hartebeest and gnus, bunches of spears and assegais and leather shields, racks of swords and daggers and old guns. This is a super place, murmured Barney. I'm jolly glad we came, aren't you? I had to look up one of the words in that paragraph. Assegais are swords um, that are used by the tribes in South Africa. I didn't know that, so I've learned something new today. Mrs Falcon Green clapped her hands loudly. Now then, children, she called. I think we're all here, so we'll start off by dancing. I expect you all know it, don't you, girls? And you can show the boys. Most of the girls began twittering with pleasure and formed themselves in a line ready to begin. But there were glum looks among the boys and they stood around grasping various weapons. Oh, it was going to be that sort of party, was it? Come on, boys, line up. All pistols, tomahawks, ray guns and stone axes on the oak chest, if you please, caroled Mrs Falcon Green, and she sat down at a big grand piano. The boys lined up sheepishly and the music began, and the girls hopped and skipped and the boys blundered and bumped, and everyone was rather glad when the dance was over. Mrs Falcon Green had got everything well organised. After the dancing they had guessing games and acting games and sitting in a ring games, and she had just handed out pieces of paper and pencils to everyone who could write and got one of the older girls to do Ring of Roses with the little ones when all the lights went out. Oh, the fuses, wailed Mrs Falcon Green. One of you older ones, get a game going, will you? I won't be long, I hope. And she made her way into the back part of the house. There was a lot of scuffling and squeaking in the dark, only lit by the flickering flames from the big fireplace. Of course, it had to be Lou who thought of something. We'll have a leopard hunt, she said. Give me twenty to get away and you've all got to hunt me and put me in a cage, all right? There were shouts of agreement. Boys scrambled for their weapons in the dark. Several people counted up to twenty. Everybody shouted, coming! And except for a few tiny ones who stayed by the fire, everyone scattered up the stairs and along the corridors, whooping and chattering and telling each other to be quiet. Barney was one of the first up the broad staircase and onto the dark landing. Moonlight came in through a leaded window and shone on a figure standing there. He was just going to say something to it when he noticed it was an empty suit of old-fashioned armour. But there was someone coming up the stairs close behind. He saw the headdress of the Indian chief. Have you seen the leopard? asked the Indian. No, said Barney. Let's go along here. They went along the corridor and at the end there was a bare wooden staircase going up and down. Come on up, said the Indian. They climbed the stairs, their feet making quite a lot of noise on the bare boards, and found themselves almost at the top of the house. There was an unlived-in feeling up there. The Indian tried the door of a room and it opened. There was nothing but boxes and trunks in the room, and there was a big window through which the moonlight came. That leads onto the roof, that window said the Indian. I know, I've been there. Perhaps she's on the roof, the leopard. Perhaps she's on the roof. The leopard, I mean, said Barney. Might be, said the Indian. He struggled to open the window. They both got through it and out to a ledge with a parapet. The roof sloped up behind them. They leaned over the parapet and looked a long way down to the moonlit lawn. And there, in the middle of the lawn, an animal was crouching. Barney's heart gave a bump, although he knew he was only hunting for his sister. Look, he gasped to his friend, the Indian. There it is, the leopard, down there. Crumbs, explained the Indian. Doesn't it look real? Come on, down again, quick. They got back in through the window, 
bumped through the box room, clattered down the stairs and made for the main staircase, calling out, Outside, everybody! The leopard's in the garden! Everybody out! Hunters who had been crawling under beds and giggling in closets and wardrobes made for the staircase too, and the big door was left open and they all streamed out into the moonlit garden. In the shrubbery, shouted Barney. Leopards in the shrubbery. Let's drive it out. Pirates, cowboys and shepherdesses piled into the shrubbery, whooping and crashing. And out of the corner of his eye, Barney saw something bolt out of the undergrowth and into the shadow of the house. Tally-ho, he hallooed, and sped after it along the gravel path and round the back, past greenhouses and outbuildings. He heard running feet behind him. The Indian and some other hunters were on the trail too. In front of him were two big wooden gates, open and leading into a paved stable yard with buildings all round it. In there, he panted, I saw it go. He dashed through the gateway and at least half a dozen others clattered in with him. Quick, shut the gates, don't let it get out, he heard the Indian say and the heavy wooden doors banged too behind him. But Barney stood rooted to the pavement, unable to move. The other children behind him were suddenly still and silent too. The boy, dressed as the Indian, gave a shaky whisper. There's two leopards. The moonlight shone clearly on the roofs of the buildings and the chequered paving of the yard. And clearly, in the moonlight, like two figures on a stage, Two animal forms crouched, facing each other. Both had golden, black-spotted fur and long tails. But as one of the crouching beasts turned its head to glare at the hunters by the gate, its eyes flashed green and alive in the moonlight. And under the mask of the other beast, Barney recognised the white face of his sister. How long they all stood like that, Barney didn't know. Barney grasping his stone axe, but feeling as if he was turned to stone himself. Lou crouched there, desperately willing her whole body to turn into a real, live, wild beast to meet this awful peril. And the real, live leopard itself, because it couldn't be anything else, frightened by the hullabaloo, mystified by the strange half-beast, half-human that faced it, cornered and angry. It was like a nightmare game when nobody knew what the next move should be. And then Barney heard the Indian behind him give another hoarse whisper. Two cavemen. For out of the shadows at the far end of the yard appeared a figure that might have been his own reflection in a mirror. Shaggy hair, rabbit skins and bare limbs. But this one carried a long spear with a glinting blade and it was levelled at the real leopard. And suddenly, Barney's limbs unfroze, and he whispered, Stig! The leopard shifted its gaze. It shot a glance at Barney. It looked back at the unmoving Lou. It turned to the advancing Stig and gave a low growl. Its tail twitched, and it began tucking its feet under it, as a cat does when it's about to charge and spring. Stig crouched too still pointing his spear, and Barney saw that in the shadows beyond Stig was, was the open door of an empty stable. The leopard had decided which was its most dangerous enemy and now kept its eyes on Stig. Barney crept forward behind it. He was almost within axe reach of its twitching tail. The leopard stopped shifting its feet. Its tail lay still for an instant. Its muscles were tense. It sprang, but as it sprang, Barney brought his axe down on the tip of the tail. Lou burst into life with a sudden roar. Stig threw himself sideways, and the startled and, conf startled and confused leopard jumped twice as high and twice as far as it had meant to, and it vanished into the dark doorway of the stable. Barney hurled himself forward, slammed the lower half of the door shut, and then the upper half, and gasped, Quick, quick, somebody, bolt it! Lou and the Indian struggled with the bolts, and at last they had all sank down on the pavement, feeling exhausted and weak. 
The other children had now opened the gates of the yard and the rest of the party was streaming in, chattering and asking questions. Where's the leopard? Have you caught the leopard? Is the game over now? What do you mean it was a real leopard? Let's have another leopard hunt. It was super fun. Why can't we have another leopard hunt? What do you mean the leopard's in the stable? There's the leopard. Two leopards. Well, that's not fair. Nobody told us there were two leopards. Why can't we see the other leopard in the stable? Let's let it out and have another hunt. And the boy in the Zorro suit was actually fumbling with the bolts and trying to open the door of the stable. Stig, who was standing there, wrapped him over the knuckles with the haft of his spear. All right, caveman, said Zorro crossly. I can open the door if I want to. It's not your business. But Stig turned his spear round and threatened him with the point. And Zorro retreated, saying, No need to get nasty. Then suddenly all the windows of the big house blazed with light again and then the voice of Mrs Falcon Green came from the front steps calling Children, children, you're all to come in at once. Everyone inside as quick as ever you can. She sounded as if she was almost frightened of something. As they all trooped round to the front entrance they noticed a big truck in the drive and strange men standing around and some of the men had rifles. Mrs Falcon Green was standing on the steps, flapping her hands. Come along, come along, she cried. It's so naughty of you to go outside. One, two, three, four, five. Just go in the hall and stand still while I count you all. They stood wide-eyed in the hall as Mrs Falcon Green slammed the big door behind her, leant against it with a white face, counted the guests and then counted again and muttered to herself, Oh dear, how many should there be? Little Jonathan couldn't come because of measles. And then there's Betty Strickwell didn't answer. The children began to join in with helpful voices. Where's the other caveman? Yes, there's supposed to be two cavemen. I saw them. And there's two. Please, please be quiet. You'll only confuse me, moaned Mrs Falcon Green. She turned to a strange man in a raincoat who was standing by the door. I think they're all here, Mr. Uh, she said... Would you like me to explain? Sorry to spoil your party, kiddies, said the man. I'm from Bottom Circus, and I'm afraid one of our animals got loose from its travelling cage, and it must be somewhere about here. But don't worry, we'll soon catch him. There were excited gasps and whistles from the children. Then Lou spoke up. It was a leopard, wasn't it? She said. The man looked at Lou. Yes, girlie, he smiled. Like you, only a bit fiercer and Barney stepped forward. It's all right, sir, he said. We put it in the stables, me and Stig and Lou. I'll help you get it out if you like. And that's the end of chapter seven. So here's my collection of marbles. I think I've got more than 12, but this is what Barney used to trade with Stig to get the costumes for the party. See you next time.